thinking about the spine and really omit a couple of things um, about it. Number one is the sacroiliac joint. Um, and we're going we're gonna to kind of get more into this uh, throughout the morning. But number two um, is the sciatic nerve. And I want to just go ahead and, and lay this out for you now. Um, it's probably best for you to disassociate the sciatic nerve and, and, and the back. And that's really complicated to do many times clinically because uh, a patient will present um, with very uh, similar symptomology, meaning that they may have these peripheralizations uh, occurring. And it's sometimes difficult uh, at the PTA level for you to know um, for sure if that looks like that's a disc pathology or if that's a true sciatica. And what I would really encourage you to do is think about disassociating that from the true disc pathology being a spine issue, but the sciatica being more of a hip issue. And so actually what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about sciatica today uh, in the classroom, but then we're going to break away from it and, and just say that's enough. And then when we come back in the hip uh, here in just a few short weeks, we'll revisit that. Um, but the SI joint, even though it really kind of blends from the sacrum into the ilium, um, it, it really needs to be kind of talked about here at the spine. Um, and I guess we could talk about it more at the hip, but what we know is that's just a blended area. And so we put it in right here so you guys can differentiate some things now. Um, so we're talking about a joint, right, that, that is largely immobile. And Deanna did a really good job the other day. Um, and she stated something that I feel like for the most part as PTAs, we're largely mistreated with. This, this joint needs some mobility. If it had not, if, if it didn't have the intention of having mobility, then it would have been fused. Um, and, and that's, I think, something that uh, we can all kind of agree that that would have probably been the case. And it's not, there's a joint there. And so by virtue of there being a joint, the human skeleton needed some mobility. Now, with that being said, there's not much. There really isn't. In fact, this thing is really bound down quite heavy with a lot of ligament. And so what happens here is even though there's not much movement there, some is needed. When there's too much though, that becomes a hypermobile joint, right? And when we have a hypermobile joint, we need to return it with stability. And that is kind of the purpose of putting up that joint by joint approach picture once more into this uh, module and you, you saw it and this is what we impart as 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 the as the therapist you need to learn we want to impart what they need and so by virtue of this joint now losing its stability we need to impart stability back on its behalf does that make good sense to you so when the joint is disrupted, it kind of follows a unique uh, pathology pattern right there. And, and I've listed four things for you. Uh, and so of those four things, any one of those or a combination could happen. Um, but most commonly we, we see it trend down one of the four paths. The first one that we want to talk to you about is not really hypermobility, but rather hypomobility. Um, hypomobility meaning it doesn't move what it should. Uh, and so as what we would see there is we would see kind of a tight hip structure uh, and they would probably be displayed more in their gait uh, is where we would see that, but also in activities of daily living uh, such as squatting um, and things of such. So they could develop more of a hypomobility. And in that case, we would reverse our thinking, right? We would want to add some in. Now, let's just kind of, let's just do this softly here. When a joint is hypomobile, meaning it doesn't move very much, what are some of the things that you can think of strategically that you would want to employ? 
Yeah. We could start with muscle stretching, right? And we know that stretching, by virtue of what it does, does have a component into the joint, right? So that would be one of my first areas. Um, and, and think about this. What, what kind of stretches would you do around that hip area? I'd stretch the hip flexors. What else would you stretch? Maybe the piriformis. What else you got? Like, name some. Uh, glute max. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only hip extensor you know? <laughs> oh, the glute meat a little bit. Does it? I don't know. Is that its primary role, the hip extent? What if I took this patient and they were laying supine and I did this right here? Yeah. Because what are the hamstrings role? Not just knee flexion. Let's not get so close-minded that we just remember the hamstrings doing that, right? But how do we stretch a hamstring as we do hip flexion, which stretches the hip extensors, and that is the hamstrings, right? So remember, they have a proximal origin of what? The ischial tube, right? And so we definitely want to stretch those guys again. And so, yeah, we want to stretch all of that soft tissue. Now, as you kind of get out into the world and you start learning some other things, you'll see some techniques that exist for stretching the joint, uh, like especially in the grade one, two mobilizations. And then today, I'm gonna to show you just a couple of quick things on what to do here for the SI directly, uh, what we can do to employ some mobilization, but sometimes these things get stuck. And that's really just kind of what I want you to think about is that joint just kind of gets stuck. And when it does, normal movement just doesn't happen or they elicit some pain response. And that's another issue that you kind of have to deal with. All right, so there's hypomobility. What's number two? Somebody give me that word. Anterior rotator denominator. All right, so let me, let me do this in reverse. Have you ever heard that word denominant before? No. No? Anominate. So the denominant is a reference to one side of the ilium, right here, All right? Now, here's what you gotta do. You gotta go back and you gotta build this fundamentally, just like you, you learned before. Let's all, let's all kind of get in a position where we can do this and sitting, standing, whatever you're doing, you can do this. But real quick for me, would you make your anterior pelvis tilt? Everybody in the anterior pelvic tilt? When I get into a standing anterior pelvic tilt, take a look at what my lumbar spine does. What's it do? Increases. Say it, say it back. Lordosis. Yeah. Lordosis. I don't have a lordosis on. Yeah. Lordosis. I do have a lordosis, yeah. I increase my lordosis, got a little hyper extension there, right? And so everyone would agree that because of an anterior pelvic tilt, meaning that my ASIS goes what direction? Forward, right? That I get an increase there. We'll kind of get into that here in a minute, but let's just kind of stay on this softly. So we have an anterior rotation innominant, right? So let's put those words together. You have this innominant right here. That is just another word that you will see in the literature that references the ilium. And what happens, it's really more of the joint, but it rotates what? Anteriorly. Now, unlike your anterior pelvic tilt, it's done it on one side. And it's a pathology. An anterior pelvic tilt, we did that by engaging some muscles, right? We did that by engaging some muscles. This is done because of trauma to this joint right here. It literally goes in one side. And so I really like how my friend, the chiropractor says it, you have a rotated pelvis. And that's just a soft, easy way. And we're like, oh, yep, I can get that, right? Because one of the bones of the pelvis, the ilium, 
also known as the innominate, has rotated, right? Now, many times we get kind of a little bit confused here because then we, we, we like to divert to our uh, conversation over gait, and we think that pelvic rotation happens in the transverse plane, right? And you would not be wrong because in gait, there is a certain degree of hip rotation that has to have pelvic rotation, right? In the transverse plane. How many degrees is that, by the way? Four. four going this way, four going this way, right? That's normal. Yeah. And so if that happens, we're all good. But I'm not talking about that kind of rotation, am I? I'm talking about a very different one, and I'm, I'm applying it just to one side. And so we're saying just one side did an anterior pelvic tilt. Like that right there. Are you good there? All right, so if you got that, then you got the next one, which is a what? Posterior, Posterior rotated, rotated innominate. Now, as you look at this, and this looks different from the front and the back both, what's happened here is this side has went and it's rotated backwards. The ASIS has moved posteriorly. Right, that's, that's our landmark that we like to look at for that. All right, one more here. One more crazy thing that can happen is, is number four, and that's called an upslip. Now, I bet I could, I could just walk away and you guys would get this one. But that means that this whole thing right here has not rotated anteriorly, it has not rotated posteriorly, but rather it has got a action going on, right? Now, follow me here. Any one of those three, whether it's an anterior, posterior, or an upslip, would definitely change the length of that guy right there. It would definitely change the length of this guy right here. Because isn't there a binding of ligament right here known as the iliofemoral, right? And it holds this in. Big bonus points here. What's the ligament that's located right here? The bigalow. The what? Bigalow. Bigalow. Why ligament? What? What? Bigalow. Look at me. I know. He's trying to blame you, Aaron. What? What have you been teaching? I said the ligament of bigalow. It's the around. Ligamentum teres? Ligamentum teres. I don't know. I'm going to have to, we're going to have to get together later and talk about the big ligament. I'm not sure on that one. So, and, it, and remember, it gives a blood supply, right, to the femoral head. And without it, an avascular necrosis could occur. And if that's kind of ringing a bell, great. If it's not, let's, we'll, we'll hit that one later. But there's a binding of ligament right there. And so when this slip happens forward, or rotation happens forward, or rotation happens backward, here's what happens. Whoa. And now they're going like this. And they may have a short leg, or maybe the rotation was such that now they have a long leg. And so, they're, and so you see this transition again, where at in their gait, that's where you're gonna see it. And they're gonna say it hurts. Well, why do you think it hurts? Because this stuff right here is not doing what it's supposed to do. And then you have to talk about all the neighbors that are involved, right? So we go back to all those muscles that we just listed about hypomobility, and we talk about those guys. We talk about the ligaments who are now being stretched and strained, and this abundance of nerve tissue that's going all the way down that leg, they got some big pain problems, right? And some of these folks are not even interested in doing this thing called walk. Right? They're just not. So when they come to you, um, it's incredibly important for you, the therapist, to have an appreciation on what to do best. Now what let's do.